Uh, and you mentioned uh, Project Ticken. Um, talk to us about, okay, there are lots of you know, misconceptions that people have about um, Orthodox Jews and ultra-Orthodox Jews, but Project Ticken is trying to address some of the issues. So what do you consider uh, some of the legitimate issues that, that may exist within the ultra-Orthodox world that, again, might, might, might not be, as you say, like rampant uh, any more so than they are in any other community, but things that may need addressing or that you see are uh, fairly um, commonplace misapplications of how, what Judaism really should be. So just to kind of like unpack how Tikkun got started and you know what we're doing now, um, the people that we're dealing with at Mako, I would say to have some of the most tragic and sad stories within the Haredi ultra-Orthodox world. And so what I want people watching this to understand is that there is a whole population of people that is not coming to us that are, they're not going to Netflix, they're not writing memoirs, they're not coming to us for help. They're living their lives in very happy and healthy ways. And we basically never hear from them because they're just, you know, tucked away in, in uh, their Haredi neighborhood somewhere. Um, the stories that started coming to us from our members um, were very distressing to hear. Um, and they were different forms of abuse happening at home, happening in school, or happening both at home and school. And I began to write down a list sort of from my own sanity. Um, when I would hear about a new issue, whether it was how classes were being taught to brides um, or how you know um, teachers in school were talking about non-Jews, um, it was very distressing to hear that you know, there were pockets of the community where this was happening. And to be clear, I don't actually have hard data on how big or how small these problems are. Um, if you talk to someone who was raised in an unhappy way, they will assure you this is the majority. If you talk to someone who's raised in a happy way, they will assure you this is the minority. So it's very hard to be able to speak honestly about those numbers. But I do believe that it's more than a few bad apples. I do believe that there is something systemic going on. And it does tend to be in certain schools that are more extremist. Um, although what we've seen is that when a family is healthier, they can send a kid to a school that may be less healthy and the kid generally can be okay because the parents will filter out bad messages or dumb messages. You know, some of it is even um, silencing the kids' questions in school when they should encourage them to ask questions. Some of it is distilling over everything from tradition to law to, you know, stringency as um, the same level of importance as opposed to uh, different pieces of Jewish law and tradition have different weight to them. Um, and there are different opinions and sort of giving a very narrow understanding of what's required. Um, and so, um, you know, the work that we're, we're doing um, at Tikkun um, is obviously a lot <laughs> to unpack. Um, we're not doing this ourselves alone. The way that we see this vision going really is to partner with insiders within this world, with rabbis, with leadership, with other nonprofits that exist, and bring them the stories that we're hearing, really to give voice to the people coming to us that otherwise could be discredited as, oh, they're ex-religious, they're mentally ill, they're just someone complaining. We're trying to bring these stories now with credibility to say, we're an organization that um, is big believers in, in Torah, in Judaism, in a religious way of life. Um, and we cheerlead all the time, but there's certain things we can cheerlead for. We can cheerlead when, you know, X, Y, Z is wrong. And part of making a Kiddush Hashem is being self-reflective. Part of um, being a religious Jew um, is doing a cheshbon hanefesh, uh, you know, to do a calculation of, you know, sort of where you are, who you are, how you're doing. And so we see this as fitting into, you know, that package, but I will tell you the, really how we're handling Tikkun is to not be that public about the issues for the very purpose that we have a sensitivity um, for you know, not sort of overexposing these issues. I think if you put someone sort of back them into a wall and tell them how bad they've been, they you know, really get reactive. Um, whereas if you have more of a gentle conversation, if this seems to be a struggle, what can we do to alleviate it? Um, you know, we're here for your good. Um, that's a very different approach as, you know, to the one where, you know, we're accusing and angry. Um, and so we're really trying to keep the work that we're doing at Tikkun more on the quiet side, more behind the scenes. Um, what we're being outright and honest about is the fact that it needs to be done. The other thing that I want to mention that I learned through our Mako members that I don't know I don't know what the percentage of your viewers or you know, Jews in the UK are, 
what we discovered is that nearly 100% of um, the Hasidic community is either survivors of the Holocaust or descendants of survivors. And so when I was growing up, I don't have a single survivor in my family. My husband doesn't have a single survivor in his family. And we sort of mix with different types of people that had different life experiences. What I do have in my family is one grandfather who's a pogrom survivor. And I can tell you that being held up with a gun with his whole family and getting away sort of in the nick of time clouded his perception on uh, God, on non-Jews. It really you know, had a very negative impact on him for the rest of his life. And that was part of my mother's story, but because she had her mother and then my father and then his sort of all American, you know, optimistic background, what I was raised in was a much more positive outlook on life. And what I think is a really interesting thing to consider is that if you have a community that's basically all sort of trying to recover from a trauma so tremendous with very little mixing with the outside world, it's not surprising that dysfunctional patterns would uh, you know, become intergenerational at that point. I think you know, we could see something very similar in the black community, you know, a history of so much racism and slavery in a community being mistreated, dysfunctional intergenerational trauma um, pops up. And so it's not to give excuses for people misbehaving or doing the wrong thing. But I do think that as we approach this topic, we do need to give the community grace um, and sort of take a step back and understand where they're coming from. Because again, if you want someone to be receptive to feedback, um, you have to just sort of look at the whole picture and something like especially traumatic happened to the Hasidic community. They stayed in Europe when other Jews had left earlier. Um, and these were like sole survivors of families of maybe 12 or 14 children, picking up, marrying another sole survivor and then trying to restart life from scratch. Well, absolutely. And, and I actually think that one of the, um, the core issues that can create dysfunctional religion and dysfunctional uh, religious families or communities is when, is when religious practice is rooted or based in fear, 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 fear primarily. Um, yeah. And I actually, um, I think Christianity has some responsibility for that, strangely, because they, they turn, Christianity basically turned religion into about how do I get to heaven? And when, yeah. when, when, when religion becomes, or serving God becomes, how do I get my spot in heaven? It's entirely about one's self, spiritual self-preservation, which becomes burdensome, and also it's gonna lead one to become very fearful and very bur burdened. Uh, but, yeah. but that's actually serving yourself, it's not serving God. Um, and so it's really missing the point of um, Judaism, which is God inviting us into a relationship with him and to make this world more heavenly. Um, and so I think that's, I think to me, as someone that, you know, grew in my observance, sort of similar-ish kind of story, grew up, grew in my observance, um, and then sort of entered into the uh, ultra-Orthodox world and really kind of um, saw it up and close and, and, and sees many, much goodness and greatness and terror learning and observance that comes from it. Also, I think one of the um, slightly more problematic um, elements that can sometimes be manifest is is rooted in 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 this problem um I, but, I, but, but in terms of the holocaust though if you think about if an entire family is decimated with a sole survivor to come out of that and think that god is an angry vengeful god and now give over that messaging to your children and grandchildren um or to have rebbies or teachers now that have you know were uh you know violently beaten in the holocaust and now do that to their students uh, it it follows it makes sense that to sort of live under such a dark cloud you would yeah. start to see uh, such a perspective. So um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely another thing. I'll tell you about our first Makam Shavuotom that we did. Um, one of the participants there told me, of course, I believe in God, but he's the boogeyman waiting to strike me down. And that was definitely like, you know, a comment that will stick with me forever because I really had a shift in understanding at that point um, in how uh, the people coming to us really running from a negative connection to Judaism had been inculcated with very uh, bad ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I'm not saying I don't understand how these misconceptions have happened. I'm not saying anyone is to blame um, at all. I'm just saying that th these, these, these uh, perceptions of God and Judaism are a problem. And I think um, people saying stuff like, you know, I see God as this, this Thing in the uh, being in the sky waiting to strike me down. I, I, I'm sure that reduces God to tears because um, the God of the Torah is one that 
if, you know, if he ever shows emotion towards us and, and it's some kind of negative emotion like anger or, or frustration, it's an amazing compliment to us to how vulnerable he is to us and to, to, to desiring a relationship with us. You only get angry and upset by the people you care about, the people you love. And um, I think um, sometimes it's just a, a perspective shift um, that, that, that's needed. Um, and yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's really, uh, really, really sad when, when you know, people have these uh, perspectives. And, and honestly, I would, I would say to people, when I, when I talk about, about you know, the Holocaust and, and other such issues and, and people relate to God in such a way, um, the one thing I would certainly say is that given everything he's put us through, he, I, can, I can only imagine the only decent thing of God is to be totally amazed by the fact that any Jew today would wish to forget do a mitzvah, know about a mitzvah, identify as a Jew. I, I think God is, comp we have far exceeded his expectations given the unparalleled uh, evil that, that we've been put up against. And so the only decent thing that we could expect of God at this stage is that th th there's no room for anger. There's no room for that. that. That it just wouldn't be decent of him. The only decent thing of him would be to be uh, to be just just touched by any any Jew's desire to connect at all. And, and lastly, I just want to talk about this incredible work you do with Project Macom because you know there are organisations that try to help people that have had traumatic experiences in the ultra orthodox world and take them into a secular lifestyle, but that doesn't bring them meaning and connection. And it also sometimes makes them think the only answer is no connection to, to Judaism. And so Kola Kavod to you, who is trying to tell people, no, you can, and I've always felt this, you can have a relationship with Judaism, but it doesn't have to be the dysfunctional one that you grew up in. So you've spoken a bit about this, but I, I just wondered if are there any other stories that, that stand out to you through your experience in doing this that really, really highlight um, this point? I'll, I'll just give you a, a quick uh, sort of background of how Makom came to um, came about. Just because, keep in mind, we were not trying to speak to this community when we started Jew in the City originally and started putting out the content, which again we now call our Kenter branch. Um, we were trying to speak to uh, non-Orthodox Jews, maybe a few non-Jews. We started seeing all of these Orthodox Jews, you know, writing in, talking about how it was giving them inspiration and connection and explaining you know, mitzvahs in a way that they had never, you know, seen in such a meaningful way, which was a nice side benefit. Then we started to hear from the angry ex-Orthodox community. And there was some really not nice comments like lies, whitewashing, don't trust these people, which was upsetting because I thought that, you know, I had seen a range of Orthodox Jews and they all seemed to be living very nice lives. Um, and it was very surprising. Um, it was in 2014 that I was giving a talk in a university for beginners, for totally non-observant uh, college students um, in Muncie when an ex-Hasidic couple came to the class. They were not invited, but they saw I had posted on social media and they said, um, we were raised ultra Hasidish. Um, it was too much for us to stay there, but we don't want to lose our connection completely. Uh, can you help us? And um, I didn't really know what to say because I only speak a little bit of Yiddish, not, not very, uh, you know, good Hasidish Yiddish, um, but here what were Jews that were looking, you know, to find a positive connection to orthodoxy. So it was sort of what we were doing. I said, look, you know, come to us for Shabbos, meet our friends, meet our rabbis, we'll show you what our lives look like. Um, I got interrupted and the couple left and I felt horrible because I just lost the lost couple. And on the way home from this talk, I started calling people in different Jewish organizations um, and, you know, said, I think we need to do something. I think all these stories that we see of people leaving completely, it's not because they all wanted to necessarily, it's because we didn't help them fit in. Um, and people told me two things, nobody's gonna fund this and you'll get banned, you'll get put in Khairim. So I gave up um, on this idea for a while. And nine months later, I read about a woman who had spent nine months trying to acclimate into a different black hat community. She was raised in a very um, ultra Hasidic community. And then she tried to go to another uh, ultra Orthodox community. And um, she tried to get her ex Hasidish Yiddish speaking son into a school. Nobody wanted him. He was on his way down. Um, nobody had him over for Shabbos. She had to pay a neighbor to play with her son on Shabbos. He was so lonely. Um, and after feeling like garbage for a few years, she picked up and she left observance. Um, and I read her story and I thought like, okay, we have to do something now. 
because all this time we're blaming, you know, these other organizations for helping people leave. And there's a couple in Israel, there's one in the US, I'm not sure what's in the UK, but there are organizations set up to help people leave. And here I'm thinking, we're, it's the religious Jews that have helped these people leave. If we were just there, if we had just made space at our table, if we just made space in our homes and our hearts, then maybe they would feel like they belong somewhere in our community. And so that's how the name Makom was born, space, place. Um, and basically I wrote these stories down. The lost couple wrote in and said that that was us. And I did have them for Shabbos. Um, and I asked anyone interested to, you know, speak up now and get involved And 200 people around the world commented that they wanted to volunteer, um, including an ex Hasidic woman who had landed more in a centrist place in a healthy place. And um, she said she wanted to volunteer. Um, and so this woman really helped get Makom off the ground. We did market research. We spoke to many people who had left and they had said that if there had been a program around to help them on their way out, they would have retained a connection to Judaism and to observance. Um, and we got a bunch of programming done in 2015. And then by 2016, um, we were able to raise seed money to get this program off the ground. Um, and what we found is that not everyone that comes to Makom, um, or sorry, let me say like this. We are helping people from that community even if they don't come to Makom. For instance, I was at the Yeshiva University graduation several years ago, and I saw this very Hasidic looking family with beaming faces, long curly payas, you know, double head covering, and so proud of whoever their graduate was. I wrote on our Makom Facebook group, I know most of you don't have family support, but there's a graduate here today who does. And a guy wrote in, oh, that's my friend's family. Everybody knows everybody. And he introduced me to the friend and the guy said to me, uh, I just want to thank you um, for all of your Jew in the City videos. They helped me back when I was in Yeshiva in Satmar, Montreal. And I thought like, what? Uh, we were not trying to reach people in Satmar, Montreal when we made our videos. Um, and I said, you know, did they help you? And he said, um, you know, I was miserable where I was. Um, and I went online to see what else was out there. And I found just a different way of being an observant Jew and I pursued it. Now, why did he just stick with our Keter content and not have to go to Makom? Because he was a brilliant guy who ended up becoming an architect and because his family supported him. So maybe his situation wasn't 100% what he wanted it to be, but because he had a family there that was willing to help him on his journey, it was a healthy enough and, you know, functioning in a family that they were okay with him ending up a little bit different. That's why a story like that, a person could make a little bit of a tweak and still retain a positive connection to Judaism. Maybe the school wasn't working from the community, but the family was there to support him. And so um, the exciting thing about the work that we're doing is that we can reach people by the hundreds through our mock home work up close one-on-one, -on -one, but then we're reaching over a million people per month on our catcher channels. Um, and you don't even know like where those, you know, those stories are leading because most of them never actually tell them our sto their stories. Really incredible. Uh, you're, you're, you're dealing with so many needed uh, issues or issues that require addressing. Uh, it's really amazing what you do and we strongly encourage our viewers to check out Jew in the City. You can see all the various different elements to what Alison, what uh, the organization does there. Um, just want to thank you so much for your time. Please get involved, find ways to uh, support it in whichever way you can. Um, and uh, Alison, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing us with us your story. And if there's ways in which I can be of help or JTV can be of help, please do let us know. Thank you so much. Great to talk to you. Thank you.